Hi, Misha here. And last time we looked at the BMP series. Really, the first true infantry fighting vehicle in the world. Definitely Russia's first infantry fighting vehicle. And at the end of that video, I teased the subject of today's video. The BMD, the fighting vehicle of the Russian Airborne Forces. Literally the vehicle of the Airborne. And we have two 172 scale die casts here again. These are both from Eagle Moss. Here we have the BMD-1. And here we have the BMD-4. And you might be asking, what about the 2 and the 3? Well, we'll get to that. But these do kind of mark the two major generations. And while the BMP was definitely a forward-thinking vehicle, and very unique, it could travel quite quickly, even over water. And it had a lot of protection for its day and time against nuclear chemical. The BMD is really something else. Not only can it do the same things, traveling on roads, cross country, water, uh, but they drop this shit out of planes um, using a parachute and a retro rocket. Yay, Soyuz program. They would drop these vehicles out, even with crew on board. So yeah, it was pretty much just like the beginning of Aliens there. Very interesting thing, and a very interesting way for Russia to do kind of power projection in the 70s and 80s. And they're still in use today. So hell, let's get into it. So here we have the BMP-1 and the BMD-1 side by side. Again, these are on the same scale. And the BMD is very much inspired by, and even parts of it based on, the BMP. Yet, it is a wholly different design for a somewhat similar but also different purpose. So, in the, uh, in the 50s, yeah, Russia wanted to motorize its infantry and protect them better. I talked about that in the first video. Well, in the 60s, after events like the Cuban, well, really the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, escalating tensions in Southeast Asia, Russia wanted to make its airborne units, the VDV, more uh, flexible, having more range, just uh, able to kind of go further behind enemy lines and be effective. And studies showed, shocker, that paratroopers on foot, or even with some very light vehicles, were not very effective fighting against armor, even light armor. I know, crazy, huh? And they had plenty of other limitations. Now, they did have some airdroppable equipment, like, for example, the ASU-57, or as my speech says, the ASU-57 artillery piece, field gun. And they would have even some airdroppable APCs. But, you know, the standard motorized infantry were getting the BMP-1, so they rightfully thought, let's do a version for the Airborne. And since KMZ, KMT as some people say, it's, yeah, had the thing going on for the BMP, this time the project would find its way to the Volgograd tractor factory. And they had made an unsuccessful prototype for the what would be the BMP, known as the Object 914. They'd also worked on light tanks and do a lot from the PT-76, which was an amphibious light tank. So those were kind of the base influences, which led to the Object 915, which was basically a 914 made smaller and lighter and more for this purpose. And the program really began in 1965. And by 1967, a few prototypes were ready and limited field trials kicked off. And 
1968, a limited production run was conducted to, uh, well, make a few, tweak a few things. And it was accepted into service in April of 1969. And mass production would commence by 1970. So what exactly do we have here, and how is it the same, and how is it different from the BMP? The idea behind the BMD, it needed to be droppable from an aircraft, and at the time it was the AN-12. Later on, the IL-76, and even some helicopters like the MI-6 could, uh, could drop it. And originally they were going to drop it just with big parachutes, but they would change this. But anyway, the, the idea, it needed to be as compact as possible, and they needed to have it at about seven tons unloaded. They didn't quite match that. But anyway, the armor was a kind of neat aluminum alloy. It was over 90% aluminum with virtually no steel used in it. But even then, it had to be quite thin. In a lot of areas, it's uh, under half an inch. In many areas, it's just over half an inch. And even at its thickest, it is still well under two inches, closer to like an inch and a third. And this being kind of uh, alloy armor at that. So lightweight, but it was never designed to protect against 20 millimeter or even 50 caliber shells, just small arms, shrapnel, splinters, that kind of thing. You know, kind of a better than nothing. The overall size, you know, the BMP here, it's 22 feet long, a little more. The BMD is just over 17 and a half feet long, quite a bit shorter. It's also narrower, a little over eight feet side to side. And it is shorter. The BMP is already quite short, but the BMD is just about six and a half feet tall. So some people are taller than this thing. But interestingly, it uses the same turret as the BMP. One, it's 73 millimeter smooth bore with 40 rounds. And it also carries anti tank missiles guided whereas the BMP carried four standard and could carry five the BMD usually only could carry three so there was a reduction but they're still there for secondary defense we had a coaxial machine gun with 2,000 rounds this would have been I believe they were yeah they would have been the PKTs at this time and but in the hull facing forward we have two more PKTs, one on each side, and these had a total of 4,000 rounds. So we have three machine guns, a 73 millimeter cannon, and a couple of anti-tank missiles. And one benefit of it being relatively light, it was faster than the BMP. On the road, it could get over 50 miles per hour, very fast for what it was at the time. Cross country is about the same, maybe a smidge faster, but actually in the water it could get over six miles per hour. Now that might not sound great, but the original BMPs could barely get over four miles per hour, maybe sometimes up to five if the conditions were right. So percentage-wise, it was substantially faster in water. Part of that was the weight. Part of it is the BMP relied on its tracks, whereas the BMD actually had two hydro jets to help propel it and steer it. So a different system. And yeah, the turrets were the same, but actually the internal layout, the hull, totally different. And this is where we really kind of get away from the BMP. I will say too though, as small as these are and, and uh, as lightweight as they tried to make them, even from the beginning they were overweight. They can only get them down, even after a lot of effort, to about seven and a half tons unloaded which would end up being nearly eight and a half tons fully loaded up with crew and armament and all that good stuff so let's talk about what's inside and the military service the bmp was quite a unique design but it could be said to have been inspired by infantry carriers apcs of the past 
The BMD, on the other hand, was more inspired by light tanks. One key thing, the engine is not in the front here. It's actually in the back and below. This had a few consequences. For one thing, the engine did provide a little protection for the crew and the, and the BMP. But being in the back, it did not have room for a back door. They did have room for one firing slit in the back, but not a door. Therefore, they had to use hatches to get the crew in and out of the crew compartment in the back. Just how it was. In the internal layout, as you can imagine, this is a lot smaller. Whereas the BMP, depending on the version, could, in, at least in theory, hold up to 11 people, although rarely it held over, rarely over 8, the BMD at most could hold 7. So we have, of course, one man in the turret. Then in the front, we have three people. We have the driver, more or less center. On his left, we have the commander of the tank in the vehicle. He mans one of the two bow machine guns. On the other side, next to the driver, we have another crewman who mans the other machine gun. So you have three people on the front, one in the turret. That meant the crew compartment was basically a bench seat from a minivan. You had three more people in the back. And seven, that's a decent number, but they were really crammed in there, especially with all their equipment. There were five AKs on these. There was an RPG. There was an RPK. And this is where folding stocks really were useful. And, of course, we had ammunition and fuel. Even though this held less than 80 gallons of fuel, had pretty good range, frankly, for what it was. Again, lightweight plays a good part in that. And just like with the BMP, many of the crew would dismount. In fact, they would just leave the driver and the gunner. So you had five members in a squad as standard, and again, the commander would hop out and become the squadron leader. Typically, he was a sergeant or equivalent. And uh, yeah, so yeah, these were being put into production. The West kind of got a first sneak peek at these in 1970 when there were some military exercises in Russia. But it wasn't really unveiled to the world until a parade in 1973. And at that time, NATO actually thought this was a light tank. It's that much of a compact APC type design for the crew. And oh, and by the way, of course, it has nuclear and chemical biological protection, just like the BMP. And they were in full rate production by this time in the 1970s. In 1975, an important thing was, was done. Originally, the idea was to drop these out of an aircraft with a parachute unmanned, so as light as possible. But this had logistical problems once on the ground, so they started dropping them with two crew on board, the commander and the driver, and then the other uh, members would join up as rapidly as possible. The problem is this added weight, and of course for safety, this is when they started loading these onto pallets, pushing them out of an aircraft using a drug chute to get them out. But then they had a, a retro rocket attached to some rods, so when the rods made contact with the ground, it, it would ignite the retro rocket. Very much like, yeah, a lot of the Russian space capsules, bringing it to a relatively soft landing. Although it would have been interesting to be parachuted out of an aircraft on board a, vi a fighting vehicle. But so yeah, they would drop them in. And in 1977, the product improved BMD 1P would be introduced, much like the uh, you have a BMP 1P. Did I say BMD? Yeah, this gets really confusing. You know what I mean? The 1P version, which had improved missiles and, and what have you. And these were heavily used during the opening days and months of Afghanistan. And the whole idea behind this, the aircraft could drop these with troops behind enemy lines and they had a pretty effective fighting vehicle, even verging on being a light tank. And these were used very successfully in the opening days of Afghanistan to capture far-flung locations, cities, towns, bridgeways, railways, what have you.
because typically airborne have maybe some guns, maybe a few jeeps, but a lot of times it's just on foot. And in fact, this really gave the VDV a marked edge and more of a tactical flexibility over American airborne units. Because at the time, really some might even say today, America doesn't have anything quite like this. And so it allowed them to really project their power quite a ways behind enemy lines and then they could do a link up. And this again is kind of part of the whole deep battle doctrine which Russia chose to use on and off since the 1930s. And of course for anyone who saw the opening of Red Dawn, that's kind of the idea. Um, you know, drop a bunch of these behind enemy lines. It is worth pointing out that once the B MD-1 uh, came online, they were able to retire the uh, the ASU-57 guns. Yeah, I go to this, uh, you know, because it could do the same job, but much more effectively, and it was much more flexible. These are neat little models. They're pretty inexpensive, but they, you know, good little example pieces. Mostly metal, except for the turret, and the tracks are kind of a rubber material. So they did well early on in Afghanistan, being produced by the Volgograd Tractor Factory. But their armament was geared more or less to fighting other armor, light tanks, what have you. They quickly found, just like the BMP did, that they were susceptible to landmines, booby traps, ambushes, you know, people that would strike and flee. They did use these as transports and infantry support vehicles, in Afghanistan, but they weren't, they weren't perfect. Thus, in 1983, the decision was made to phase the BMD-1 out and replace it with a product improved version that would come to be known as the BMD-2. So the BMD-2 certainly has a lot in common with the BMP-2. I don't have a BMD-2 model to show you, but that's okay. The first BMP-2s with the new high-velocity multi-use 30mm cannon, auto cannon, appeared in Afghanistan in 81 and 82, and they did well. So by 83, they decided, let's fit this new fancy armament and some new armor and a few other small changes while we're at it to the BMD and give the airborne some stuff. And they kind of went about it in two ways at the Volgograd factory. A long-term solution was to find a way to fit the two-person turret to the BMD. Unfortunately, the BMD hull was simply too small as is to take it. So it was going to take a little more time. For a more immediate stopgap solution, they found a way to fit the 30mm cannon to, and its sights and all that to the BMD-1's turret, making a new B-type turret for it. So essentially, a BMD-2 is the same as a BMD-1, at least the broad strokes, but it has the 30 millimeter instead of the 73 millimeter. It also has updated anti-tank missiles, still has a coaxial machine gun in the turret. It has a more updated modernized sighting system and it, it does have stabilization, at least on one axis, for the turret. The hull is more or less unchanged. They did add some more armor protection, a few tweaks here and there. The overall weight did climb a bit. It is worth noting that the, uh, the commander's machine gun was removed because he wasn't using it and it was a way to save a few, you know, a decent amount of pounds. Plus they reduced the number of rounds from 4,000 to about 2,900 in the hull. So again, 1,100 rounds saves a little weight. And they updated the communication systems, a new radio set, modernized version. And to make sure the commander wasn't bored, they gave him a, a few more periscopes to look out of to improve the side-to-side -side visibility. So a few little tick tricks and tricks like that. And they, they, they were able to get a prototype slapped together pretty quick. 
and these first appeared in limited numbers in Afghanistan in 1985. And at first it was hoped that they would replace the BMD-1, but production never really got super high. And then, of course, the Soviet Union collapsed. So it seems like production would end pretty much with the Soviet Union, meaning they were only built for five to six years. And they never really had enough to replace the older model. That said, they would keep using these. They would be used in places like Chechnya in the 90s, and they would show up in Georgia in 2008, and they would even show up in all the fun stuff in Ukraine over the Crimea in 2014. And uh, yeah, the BMD-2 still seems to be in some type of active service in Russia today. But it really wasn't exported because they never really had enough. I think a rock. I know a rock had the BMD one. I don't know if a rock ever got into the BMD twos or not. Either way, basically, BMD one fitted with a different gun and a few other things. But that was again, like I said, the stopgap, an immediate solution to help troops fighting in a desperate war. <laughs> not like unlike Vietnam earlier. But the idea of putting the new turret onto the airborne hull was progressing and would result in the next series. So here we have the BMD-1 compared with the BMD-4. Like I said, the BMD-2 was an interim solution developed in the 80s, but what they really wanted to do was put the larger turret, the two-man turret, from the BMP-2 onto an airborne vehicle. And that's it, pretty much what we have here. Now this is a four, but really the BMP, excuse me, the BMD-3, BMD-3M, BMD-4, and even BMD-4M are, if not the same vehicles, are e evolutions of each other. So they all kind of lump in together. And that goes back to the 1980s. And uh, yeah, work on what they wanted to do. And they were kind of trying to decide, should we do a heavy 18-ton vehicle with a 100-millimeter cannon, or should we do a lighter 12.5-ton vehicle with the 30-millimeter cannon? In the end, the answer was, yes, both, please. But for the beginning, in 1983, they decided to go with the 30-millimeter cannon in the lighter hull because two to three could be carried instead of one to two, depending on the aircraft. And this did allow them to retire the ASU-85, the ASU-85 uh, piece, much as the 57 had been retired a decade earlier because of the BMD-1. So they developed the new chassis and hull, and the first three prototypes were ready in 1985, and they were put in for testing and didn't do so hot. They were unreliable, the transmission was kind of crap, and they were grossly overweight. A second series of three more prototypes were built in 1986 and given to the Army for testing. They started testing them in October of that year, wrapping things up around October, November of the next year. And while they were still a little overweight, these, known as the Object 950, were more reliable and uh, dependable. So they were put into environmental trials and field testing in 1988 and were accepted into service in February of 1990 as the BMD-3 and soon shown to the public. Now the BMD-3, it had the 30 millimeter. it basically had the same uh, turret as the uh, BMP-2. It did have an automatic grenade launcher, which is kind of cool. And it kind of split the difference as far as a lot of things. It um, had a crew maximum of eight, mostly because of the extra man in the turret. It was a little bit longer, right around 20 feet, a little bit wider, right over 10 feet, a little bit taller between seven and eight feet, depending on uh, which exact turret and version. It was heavier. It never really was quite as light as they were hoping. It over uh, 13 tons, some verging on 14. And it uh, was a little slower on the road 
about 45 miles per hour versus 50. But it could still swim and it could still do cross country just fine. And they played around with the armament in the uh, in the bow quite a bit. And uh, they put a launcher in there. They they kind of went to dismountable equipment instead of a more or less fixed. I mean, you could remove the PKT, but it was a tank gun. They went to removable infantry guns like the RPK poking out, even a removable grenade launcher, things like that. And they would eventually go to a stabilized turret. You get the idea. But because the Soviet Union was falling apart, the BMD-3 was only produced in limited numbers up to about 1997. They built 137 production versions plus the six prototypes. But they did go into uh, Russian service and have been seen uh, and still are around today. But this, of course, led to the next iteration because Russia, that's what they like to do. So now we have the BMP-3 back because the BMD-3M, the modernized version, was getting more towards this. It would have several improvements to the weaponry going to a new turret. This is all kind of hazy at this point because, well, the Volgograd factory was soon to go bankrupt. And actually, KMZ makers of the BMP, would take over the line. But basically, the BMD-3M was renamed the BMD-4. They made a few token changes, but it was a marketing thing, really. That was around 2003-2004, and the uh, Russian military adopted it in December of that year as the BMD-4 and would order them. But then Volgograd would go, KMZ would take over, and yeah, kind of here we are. The main thing is with the BMD 3M, BMD 4, we're using much of the same turret and gun as the BMP 3. It has the 100mm and the 30mm guns, 100mm cannon that can also fire missiles, and the 30mm autocannon. For its own work. Plus it carries machine guns and can have grenade launchers. It is stabilized in the modern sense. It has modern fire and control systems. Different layouts for the uh, the bow weapons kind of happen in each station. It is, you know, still has a crew of potentially eight, although oftentimes it's seven or even six. And the weight continues to grow a little bit. Now the armor protection does get better. They still use kind of the aluminium alloy composite, although they make it thicker for the hull. But the turret is now getting more steel in it. Things like that. All kinds of neat little changes. Moderniz modernization to the night vision. What have you. So, they would send 60 BMD-4s to the military. And... KMZ was all ready in 2008 to replace it with a further updated version, the BMD-4M, which had an improved uh, chassis. It shared the same engine as the BMD, excuse me, BMP-3, and a few other common parts. The whole idea behind the 4M was actually to improve commonality with other Russian vehicles, in fact, as much as 80%, keeping the cost and whatnot down while still improving things. And they were ready to put these into full production by 2009, but then politics and disagreements in the military, if they needed it, got in the way. So things kind of stalled out for a few years. In 2012, they were still kind of going over if the military needed more BMDs or if it was an outdated, obsolete vehicle. As you can imagine, because of the alloy and just general nature of these, they're kind of expensive, at least by Russian standards. Nevertheless, after years of kind of back and forth and waffling and with increased military presence in, by Russia around the world, in December of 2012, the go-ahead was given to proceed with the BMD-4M. And eight were delivered in 2014 for testing. Uh, they got pretty high marks in 2015 after evaluations. 
and in April of 2016 they were officially adopted and the BMD3M and BMD4 are officially out of production making the BMD4M the, the modern standard and again they're all kind of a, a, a take on the same thing just changing things out and KMZ actually offers several weapons and turret options because this is kind of a cool modular turret design and again the front bow weapons are uh, dismountable so you can put in whatever you need really and it's actually one of the most heavily armed and uh, capable infantry fighting vehicles in the world and then when you consider that it's air droppable that's just even more damn impressive by the way like I said originally the BMD-1 well it was good only against small arms for protection of the armor over time they would improve it to protect against 50 caliber and then in the front 20 millimeter the most recent versions can have types of reactive armor and defend up to 30 millimeter cannon shells, at least from certain angles and distances. And the weight is, um, you know, still manageable. <laughs> I mean, the uh, current BMD3, or excuse me, BMP3s with all the armor kit can be over 22 tons, whereas the BMD4M with all the kit, it's still lighter at about 15 to 16 tons. But of course we have new aircraft that can carry more, better and further. And one other kind of cool fact about the newer generations. Remember I said the BMD-1 would be dropped out of an aircraft with two crew on board. Well, starting with the 3, 3M and 4s, all the crew were on board this. So everything would drop in the vehicle and when it hit the ground, it was ready to go fighting. This saved time and was just safer for everyone. Yeah, I just think that's kind of neat. So where we're at today with the BMD-4s, or 4Ms, Russia says, at least they did last year, that they plan to buy at least 1,000, or at least up to 1,000. Uh, and uh, they're starting to take deliveries right now but it's a very new thing at least the bmd4m and that kind of gets us to where we're at as far as the airborne vehicles there are plans to replace the bmp3 with the modern infantry fighting vehicle but the uh bmd it's it's it's, it's kind of going to hang in for a while because they just adopted it with that let's wrap things up the most recent report i could find says that there are still over a thousand BMD ones in the Russian military service, at least on the on the books, and they have several hundred BMD twos, and they have a hundred plus BMD threes, but these have all been, at least the ones in active service, all been updated to the BMD four standard. Plus, they have around 60 new production BMD-4s. And as for the BMD-4M, well, like I said, they're just now coming in, so the numbers aren't terribly high, 100 or 2 at most. But all told, that's a pretty good chunk. They've got over 1,800 of these in service, which you know may not sound like a ton, but keep in mind, this is a very specialized vehicle. You know, they've got a lot more BMPs and modern APCs for that matter because, yeah, the, but I mean, to have 1,800 armed fighting vehicles in an airborne service, you know, from the beginning, this was a pretty forward thinking craft. No other air, uh, aircraft, no other thing could be airdropped and then either, you know, crawl across the earth or swim with a 73 millimeter cannon and anti tank missiles and three machine guns and carrying five dismount troops. Oh, while, while it wasn't perfect, it was certainly better than being on foot. It could get up to 50 miles per hour, and it would at least protect the people inside against small things. But between the twos, the threes, and the fours, now we're carrying a 100 millimeter gun, 
a 30 millimeter auto cannon. We have two mount points in the front for grenade launchers and machine guns. We still have machine guns usually in the turret. And we have modern computers, automated equipment, making the workload easier. Heck, now we have modern composite armor and even types of reactive armor that KMZ offers on certain versions. So, yeah. Kind of kind of cool, I think. The whole concept is just neat. And you can definitely see kind of the light tank roots of this, whereas this definitely calls back to its uh, APC ancestors a bit more. So that's why I really don't have a 2 or a 3. 2 might be kind of cool, but a 3 would look so similar to this in this small of a scale that, you know, what's the point? Funny thing is, when these models came out in Russia, which is where I imported these from, the BMD-4M didn't even really exist yet. They were released around 2012. So, yeah. But there, there we have it. A very interesting tactics, very flexible craft. And of course, very modern, very heavily armed, and compared to what NATO countries have, pretty darn economical too. Maybe not as good as the modern Western stuff, but if you can afford 10 of these for every one or two American or German-made craft, what's really the better option? That's why a lot of export countries have kind of gone that way. Anyway, I just wanted to talk about these, get a little more into the armor. Do please let me know what you think. I definitely appreciate it. Feel free to comment and all that great stuff. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.